Well, hey, community, how are you guys today? You guys doing well? Good, good, good. So good to see you today. It's uh, great to be speaking. Want to welcome everyone. Want to welcome those of you that are watching online as well today. Glad that you could join us as well. Well, today we're just going to jump right into the message. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and reach into your program. Take out the message notes page that's there. And the reason is because I want you to write something on it right as we start today. I just want you to write the year of your birth. I mean, just I want you to write it. Now, some of you are, whoops, God, come on. You're not asking me to do that. Look, if you don't, if you don't want the person next to you to know the year of your birth and just write it really small or like in Chinese or Japanese or something that they don't understand or something that, you know, just do it code. I, I don't know. But just go ahead and write the year of your birth. Now, just to show that I'm in this with you, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I have, I have mine. I'm going to write it down right now. Here we go. 1981. <laughs> just want to see if you guys are paying attention. My year's not 1981. Uh, it's 1961. So uh, that's it. And actually, Every one of us not only have a year of our birth, but we have a, a date of our birth. Mine's July the 4th, 1961. It's the day that I entered into this world, and we're also going to have another date, the day that we leave this world, and we don't like to talk about that one near as much as the day that we entered, and, but we all have those dates. We do, and, and uh, every one of us has those two dates, and but that first date, I mean, it's not like you had any control over that. Nobody asked you, hey, is today the day or when do you want to enter into the world? I mean, that, that, that doesn't happen. I mean, you may have an argument with your teenager one time and they may say, I didn't ask to be born. And in that moment, you, maybe you're tempted to say, well, if you would ask right now, I would have said no, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> not a good parenting thing to do. I'm just telling you, but, uh, but so we don't know. We can't control the day of our birth and you know, we really can't control the day of our death. I mean, but between those two days, the day of our birth and the day of our death, uh, there's a little hyphen. There's this little thing called a dash, and the dash is what our life is. It's just a dash. But it's the dash that makes up everything. I mean, all of our dreams, all of our relationships, all of our uh, accomplishments, all of our challenges, all of our victories, all of those things. We pack those, all of our entire life in, into the dash and what that dash is going to look like. And, and what the season of our life, what it looks like, the dash, will either be a blessing to this earth or, or a curse. And that's mostly really up to us on what we do with our dash, and we cram everything into the dash. And so today as we begin, I just want to ask you the question, as we start to reflect a little bit, uh, what are you going to do with your dash? I mean, this is a kind of a big picture question to think about purpose, and we all get one, just one dash. Nobody gets two. What are you going to do with your dash? Because it goes by so fast. I mean, it does, and the older I get, the faster it seems that it goes. And wise people, wise people have always reflected on the dash. They just always have. This is from Psalm chapter 90. This is what the psalmist writes. He's talking to God. And this is, I love this imagery. Uh, Psalm 90 verse 5 says, you sweep people away like dreams that disappear. What an image. For, it's crazy. I've been dreaming all week. And I mean, these crazy dreams, and then I wake up and pff, they're gone. I can't remember them. And, and, uh, but dreams that disappear, they're like grass that springs up in the morning. In the morning it blooms and flourishes, but by evening it is dry and withered. It goes by so fast. Let's read this next verse out loud together. Psalm chapter 90, verse 12. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. And the psalmist is saying that, that life is unspeakably beautiful and wonderful, but it's also it's unbelievably short. And what's amazing is that sometimes we don't realize the brevity of life and we don't live with hearts of wisdom. So the topic, the title actually of today's message is simple. It's life's too short to play it safe. And so that's what I want to unpack with you today because I, I think sometimes we just sleepwalk through life and we miss out on all the wonder that's around us. We, we walk through life maybe with blinders on and we just don't see what's around us. And God calls us to more, way more than just that. And every day, people in this world when they come to that final date, it's as if they've thrown away their one and only life. So today as we get started, 
might seem like a kind of a hard right turn, but it, it does relate to our topic today. I want to ask you a question, and then I'm going to ask you to, to share your answer with someone that's around you in a moment, but I'm going to kind of tee it up a little bit. What do you think is the most dangerous object in your home? What do you think is the most dangerous object in your home? There's a guy by the name of Larry Loud, and he's a professor of philosophy at the University of Hawaii. Now, that would be a great place to be a professor of philosophy in Hawaii. But he's written a book on risk, and he devotes an entire chapter in this book on household dangers, things that are dangerous in homes, and some of them are exactly what you would expect. 460,000 people a year are injured by kitchen knives. Our family contributed to that one year. (laughs) We bought some Cutco kitchen knives, which are awesome, but incredibly sharp. And one of our two sons almost cut off his finger from a Cutco knife. And so I took him to the ER. We walked up to the front and I said, he'll have the usual stitches. I mean, we'd just been there a few months before and he was seated in the ER in the exact seat that he sat in just a few months before. And kitchen knives can be pretty dangerous. They, they account for a lot of injuries in our country. Manual saws, power saws, no surprise there. A hundred thousand people are injured by those every year. But some of those things that he lists there in this chapter, they kind of surprise me though. They're, those kitchen knives and power saws, not a surprise, but um, I don't know if you have any drapes in, in your house. Every year, 20 people in America are strangled to death by drapery cords pretty crazy. And this is a statement, a quote directly from the book, Loudon writes annually, some 4,000, 4,000 of us now seriously injure ourselves on pillows, pillows. I'm not making that up. I don't know. I don't know if we like zip ourselves and, you know, injure ourselves that way or I don't know. He doesn't actually specify how we seriously injure ourselves on pillows, but I want to let you know, I am cautiously approaching my pillow these days. (laughs) much more cautiously. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a moment, and I just want you to share with the person next to you this, the answer to this question, what do you think is the most dangerous object in your home? Take about 10 seconds, and then switch, and let the other person share. So, go ahead. We'll get started. There you go. All right, bring it back, bring it back. Now, I don't know if there is a right or wrong answer to this question, but I want to I wanna show you what I think is one of the most dangerous objects in your home. <laughs> it's a chair. <laughs> it's, it's an easy chair. It's not a hard chair. It's an easy chair. Do you know what the number one best-selling chair in America is? Anybody? <laughs> you have one of these. <laughs> Lazy boy. Yeah, not worker boy. No. <laughs> not risky boy. Not out of boy. It's lazy boy. Because we like our comfort. I mean, we come home and, and we want to relax. We just want to sit in a chair and we want comfort. And there's not anything necessarily wrong with comfort all the time, but sometimes comfort can be very dangerous. It can be very dangerous to our lives. It really is. So what I want to do today is, if we get started, I want to kind of paint a picture for you of how comfort can actually be very dangerous to our lives. And so I'm going to kind of sit down here and immerse myself. (laughs) This is nice. (laughs) Immerse myself in comfort and just, uh, I'm going to set a whole new level, raise the bar for comfort during the preaching of a message today. Now, (laughs) when you sit in a comfortable chair like this, you have to experience, well, comfort food. You do. And so I just came prepared for that. I thought I was actually going to have to go to the store to pick up some stuff because I didn't think we had comfort food in our house, but lo and behold, we do. So anyway, so I'm going to, the first thing that I'm going to go to is, uh, I mean, it's just some Chips Ahoy chocolate chip cookies. 
I mean, these are pretty good for store-bought. Now, my wife is an excellent cook, and she's an excellent baker, and that's her hobby. Many of you know that. She loves to bake, which is a great thing. We team up well because I love to eat, and so that's wonderful. These are pretty good. They're not like her quality level, but they'll do. I mean, so I have these cookies that are here. And there's these other little things that I found in the little pantry. Belveda toasted coconut. These things are good. I'm telling you, I really enjoy those. And you got to have in the house, I mean, you got to have some good old Orville Redenbacher popcorn, which is, you know, a nice comfort food when you sit in the chair. And then let's see what else do we got in here. Well, this is not mine. I don't really like these, but she does. Twizzlers. So, I mean, those are there for her, but I brought them. And then there, this is mine. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is seriously mine. Uh, <clears throat> I've, been, I've been eating these the last few nights, late at night. I mean, I've you know, been eating these pretzels and, you know, got a clothesman here as a chip clip. Don't have a chip clip. Couldn't find it. We don't even have a clothes line, but I've got a clothes pen. <laughs> for my pretzels. And so that's good. And so, so I mean, you got to have comfort food. Now, when I sit down in a chair like this, I don't know about you, but I never sit in a chair like this by myself. I always have a couple of friends, you know, come over and visit me. And I have a couple of friends that always love to visit me and they're Ben and Jerry. <laughs> so I got to tell you, I love these guys. You know that. I talk about them from time to time. Other friends will let me down. Ben and Jerry never let me down. They don't. I mean, these are two of my best friends. And since this is a pretty big container, you know, I need a pretty big spoon. I mean, I do, you know, for this. This is a big one. It's a big one for that now. So uh, now here's the thing is that when you're sitting in a chair, I, you probably have different preferences for your comfort food than I do. But I think we can all agree that when you sit in a chair like this, you have to have one object in your hand. Anybody want to guess what the one object is? You, Remote control, yeah, you got to have the remote control in your hand, you got to. I mean, can you think about this? I mean, it was, it was for decades, for years, people used to sit in a chair like this and they didn't have a remote control. And then somebody invented the remote control and then we were finally able to watch TV the way that God had always intended. I mean, <laughs> with a remote control. Jerry Seinfeld, he said that, you know, men really aren't interested in what's on TV. They're interested in what else is on, you know, ka-chink, 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 ka-chink. Now, I want you to take a, a good look at me. I mean, just look at me right now. Do I look like I am ready to spring into action right now, do I? Okay. Well, how about now? <laughs> do, I, do I look like I'm ready to spring into action now? How about now? Do I look like I'm ready to spring into action? <laughs> Do I look like I am ready to get up and serve somebody if they have a need? Do I look like I'm ready just to explode in development and growth right now? <laughs> Do I look like I'm ready if God was to call me to go on a great adventure that I'm ready to respond? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> now, I want to talk to you for a moment about your life, and you probably never thought of it this way, but I want you to be honest with yourself. Have you pretty much purposed your life to be life in the chair? <laughs> and what I mean by that, I mean life in the chair is where you're, you're trying to arrange your life by maximizing comfort and minimizing stress and problems. Life in the chair. Because if that really is your purpose, then I just want to ask you the question. If a life like that, where you maximize comfort and you minimize stress, you minimize problems, does that make your heart beat really fast? Does that kind of a life make you just wake up in the morning and jump out of the bed with a sense of anticipation and, and wonder? Does it? I want to ask you, if, if I was to remain in this chair for the rest of the service, do you think that even I could stay awake to the end of the message? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I think the Sun Sentinel would have an article online or in the newspaper tomorrow morning, pastor falls asleep during his own sermon <laughs> and joins the rest of his congregation. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that foolishness. So. Uh, now, I want to talk to you for a moment of why I think 
that the chair can be the most dangerous object in your house. It's not because of what happens while you're in the chair. It's because of what doesn't happen. It's because of what doesn't happen while you're in the chair. It's the stuff that you don't do. It's the relationships that you don't deepen. It's the great prayers that you don't pray. It's the people in need that you don't serve because you don't even see them. It's the races that you never run. It's the battles that, that, that you're called on to fight that you never fight. It's the, it's the adventures that you could go on with your one and only life, but you don't. Why? Because you're in the chair. Friends, I want to tell you, you, you were made for something more than just the chair. We all are. You're made to do something more with your life than just try to arrange it to maximize comfort, maximize safety, maximize security. We were all made to spend our lives in a kind of risky partnership with God. And that's called faith. It's just this adventure, this risky partnership with God. And the chair may be the most dangerous object in your house, not because of what happens when you're in it, but because of what doesn't happen when you're in that chair. Now, when I say that life is too short to just play it safe all the time, it's really important that you understand this. I'm not talking about going out and doing something stupid. I'm not talking about going out and doing something impulsive. It's not about going over Niagara Falls and in a barrel. It's not about swimming with sharks. It's not about doing something incredibly ridiculous and dangerous like going shopping at Sawgrass Mills Mall on Black Friday. I'm, I'm not talking about something where you take your very life in your hands. I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about us making our ordinary lives this adventurous partnership with God that He calls us to. He calls us to more. We wake up in the morning and we say, God, I don't know what you have in store for me today, but let's do this. Let's do this. I'm just saying yes to you today. Now, today what we're going to do is we're going to look in the Bible where God comes to people. Because God comes to you. He comes to me. He comes to us and He calls us to more. He calls us to adventure. He calls us to challenge. He calls us to battles. He calls us to all kinds of things. And the great thing about the way God created us, He created us with the capacity to respond, to either say yes or no. He created us with this gift called free will. We really can say, yes, God, or uh, no, God. And we see that in the Bible again and again and again. God interrupts person after person after person in the Bible. And he gives them this, this call, this adventurous call to, that he calls them to do something. And I just want to see how it plays out in the Bible so you can see the components of the call of God on a person's life. And you can see how the call of God is on your life. And then you can just decide like people in the Bible would make decisions and decide. So I'm going to walk us through the components together with you today and, and see what they mean for you, see what they mean for me. Because here's the thing. I believe that there is an aspect of your life that God is calling you out of the chair. It may be that you already know what it is. It may be that you don't know what it is. But I'm going to try to help you figure that out. And then you have a choice of whether you're going to say yes to God or, or no to God. So let's look at the different components that are always present when God interrupts a life and calls them to something more. So the first part is the call. I mean, that's it. The call narratives all begin with God asking somebody to do something to get out of the chair. Now, I want to ask you another question at, at this point. Those of you who know a lot about the Bible, when in the Bible does God interrupt a person? I mean, he comes and he interrupts somebody's life, and then he asks them to do an easy job. I mean, when does God interrupt somebody's life and say, look, I got an assignment for you. It's kind of a piece of cake, not a big deal, no big demand. You'll be in and out in half an hour. How about it? Anybody want to guess how often that happens? Rough guess. 
Never. Never is the answer. I mean, that's the answer. Never does that happen. I mean, it never does. God never gives anybody an easy job. There's a whole chapter in the Bible, the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, one of my favorite chapters in the New Testament, in the New Testament, summarized the life of just one person after another that God interrupted, and he gives them this big call to do something. Wow. And he gives them something hard to do. God comes to Noah and says, I want you to build an ark in the midst of all kind of ridicule so that you can restart the human race on the earth. That's a pretty big thing. God comes to Abraham and says, I want you to leave everything that's familiar to you. I want you to go to another country. I will show you when you get there. God comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, I just want you to be faithful to me, even though you're being betrayed by your brothers and you've been thrown in prison and you're a slave, just be faithful to me, Joseph. God comes to Moses and, I, and says, I want you to leave a life that's, that's pretty comfortable. I mean, shepherding, you have your job, you have your sheep. And leave that and go back to Egypt where you are wanted for murder and then defy the Pharaoh. God called all kinds of people, just ordinary people. <laughs> Didn't say this, I, one of my favorite verses in the book of James, Elijah was a man just like us. I mean, we, we elevate these ordinary people that did extraordinary things because of their faith, and we should honor that, but I just want to let you know they're ordinary. They're all just ordinary people that did extraordinary things because they had an extraordinary trust in an amazing God. The writer describes the lives of people who say yes to God. I want to read some verses for you. This is, I got to tell you, my, my heart starts to beat fast when I read Hebrews chapter 11, when, when I read the descriptions of all of these people in the Old Testament and, and how they were called by God to something that wasn't easy, but they were used by God in amazing ways. Hebrews eleven thirty two. What more shall I say, the Hebrew writer says, I don't have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets, who through faith they conquered kingdoms, they administered justice, and they, they gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Not in this life. Now, after reading through words like this, how high of a value would you say that God places to make sure that people who follow Him lead comfortable lives? How high of a value would you say God places on that? Not, not very. I mean, God cares about us deeply. I mean, Jesus loves you more than you could ever know or imagine. I mean, Jesus came to die for you. But as far as the value of comfort being the primary value that he wants to bring to you, it's not, not, not very high. Jesus loves us and he wants us to grow. He wants to stretch us. He wants us to grow in courage and wisdom and faith. And Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, his purpose statement, I have come that you might have life, life in all of its fullness. But it's not primarily a, a life fullness of comfort. From the testimony of Scripture, it's, it's pretty clear that God's not particularly concerned that our lives be real comfortable. And it's real important, friends, I've got to tell you that we understand that. I, I think it is because we live in a world where comfort is elevated almost above all things. It's one of the things we're most often encouraged to pursue, to chase after, to buy at almost any cost. And sometimes people will think about God and say, I followed God and I, I said yes to God and, and He didn't make my life comfortable and He didn't give me all the things that I wanted to make me feel safe and make me feel secure. And then they can feel kind of betrayed by God. But God never promises that stuff, and God calls people generally to, to do things that may be quite difficult. And that's the first thing that happens when God interrupts a life. God, well, He 
He issues the call. And there's always, secondly, the response. I mean, that's natural. There, there's the call from God to do something, usually hard, and then there's the response. And in every case, God interrupts. The person is, chooses a response. And, and again, for those of you who are familiar with the Bible, when God brings a hard assignment for someone, how often does the person say to God something, you know, like this? Well, now, that is a great opportunity, God. I mean, that really is. I mean, defy Pharaoh, take on the Midianites, I mean, spend the night in a lion's den, walk into a fiery furnace, face jeers and floggings and prison and chains. I mean, God, this is really a great opportunity, but can you supersize it? I mean, that would be really, that's what I want. Can you supersize what you're telling me to do? Now, how often does that happen? Never What's the response of people when God comes with a challenge, a call? It's almost always, almost always fear. My story, like your story, like every human story, is the struggle as a believer, the struggle between fear and faith. I love this quote. Susan Jeffers writes, I think it's an honest one. The fear will never go away as long as I continue to grow. As long as I'm continuing to be open to what God wants me to do, there's always going to be an element of fear. And and that's a good thing because it's in the midst of our fear that we have to push through that with our faith. And the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So there's this tension between fear and faith. And God created us with a capacity for fear. And that's a good thing. We we fear falling off a cliff at the Grand Canyon. It keeps us, you know, from going over the edge. We we fear alligators and rather than, you know, petting them on the snout. Not a good plan. We fear that. We fear being around snakes. Fear is a healthy thing that God created inside of us, but it can be such a restrictive thing if we don't push through it when he calls us to push through it. It's a few weeks ago, I was just on social media, I can't remember if it was Instagram or Facebook, but I follow a pastor friend of mine, he's pastor at CCV, Christ Church of the Valley in Phoenix, where my son's on staff, and Ashley had a great quote on fear. He said, the greatest victory of your life is often on the other side of your fear. Friends, I read that and I go, that just, that's, a, that's truth there. The greatest victory of our lives is often on the other side of our fear. So what do we do? We push through that fear with faith and then we experience the adventure and the victory. And sometimes the fear is the fear of inadequacy. God comes to a character named Gideon and says, I want you to save my people from the Midianites, from their enemy. I want you to be the guy that leads them into battle. And how does Gideon respond? Judges 6, 15. The Lord, Gideon replied, but Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. I can't do this, and I'm not adequate for this. Sometimes it's not the fear of inadequacy or it's fear of failure, similar. God asked Moses and the scouts to go explore the land, the promised land. And so God sends some spies or scouts into the land and the scouts, they come back and 10 of them say in Numbers 13, 32, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw, there are great size. I mean, we're like grasshoppers in their sight comparison to them. We can never do it. We need to go back home. Now, maybe the the classic case of a fear response to a call of God on a person is actually Moses. I mean, God comes to Moses and says, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt. I want you to lead my, my children, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I know you're wanted for murder there, and I know you and the Pharaoh aren't best friends, but I want you to go back there, okay? And what was Moses' response? Sign me up, God. Supersize this thing. No, it wasn't. Moses said no to God five times. The God of the universe, the powerful creator, Moses said, I don't think it's a good idea. I, you know, I, I think there's somebody better. I mean, he gives excuse after excuse after excuse. And I mention this because sometimes people will say things like, you know, God would never ask me to do something if I was scared. <laughs> Have you read the Bible? <clears throat> And oftentimes we say this, and I've said it even before. God will never give you something more than you can handle. Have you read the Bible? (laughs) That's exactly what God does. He gives us way more than we can handle on our own. Why? So we have to push through the fear 
and have faith and trust in him. (laughs) Paul didn't say, I can do all things in my own strength. So I can do all things through Christ because he's the one who strengthens me. He's the one who gives me the strength. And so God will always give you more things than you can handle on your own. And that's when you're called to rely on his strength and his power. So friends, I want to ask you, if there's a challenge in front of you right now, if there's a course of action, if there's a road that if you were to go down this path, that it would cause you to grow. And if you were to go down this path, it would be a blessing to other people, but you're kind of scared to go down this path, be real careful about saying no. Be real careful about saying no, because that sounds like the kind of a challenge that God is in. If you would grow and other people would be blessed by this. I'm going to go a step further on this. If you're not facing any challenges too big for you in your life right now, if it's been a long time since you've been scared, it's real possible that you have been in this chair for way too long. Because this chair can be like an addiction. It, it, can, it can kind of like suck you into the chair and you can't even get up anymore. And if it's been a long time that you've ever been scared about a challenge that you may sense that God has given you. And I hope you hear this today. I've never known anybody who's had a deep, risky, bold faith in God. Never known anybody that's had a deep, risky, bold faith in God that led an easy, comfortable life, a challenge-free life. Never. I haven't. Because the chair does not build a faith that's worth having. The chair does not build a life that is worth living. It just doesn't. Nobody gets to the end of their life and they go, man, oh man, I remember the time in the chair. Those were the days. <laughs> I mean, the comfort in the chair, that was the best part of my life. I, I, wow times in the chair. No, that's not the times. It's the challenge. It's the adventure. It's the difficulty. It's the time when we trust in God and we move through that and it's the victory that's on the other side of our fear. It's never the chair. It's never the chair. Have you identified your chair? If you haven't, I'll help you in a little bit. The next component in these stories is God gives the promise. I mean, there's the call. God's calling you to do something. It's challenging, difficult, hard, maybe impossible, it seems. And then there's our initial reaction. And then there's the promise. God offers reassurance. The striking thing about these stories, even though the people, they almost always had this initial response of resistance, of saying, whoa, God, no, I, I, you know, uh, a fear of inadequacy, uh, a fear of failure. There's almost always that in these responses. God never reacts himself by saying, you know what? <laughs> Good point. I never really saw it from your perspective. I get that you would be scared, you know. As a matter of fact, let me go ask somebody else. (laughs) God never does that. God knows people get scared. He created us with that capacity. And fear can serve us well in some circumstances, but it can hold us back in so many others. And so he makes a promise. So God says to Gideon, Judges chapter 6, verse 12, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I love what God says to Joshua. He was the successor of Moses. Moses led the children of Israel, and now now Joshua has been handed the baton to lead. And and evidently, Joshua is pretty frightened about this monumental responsibility of leading the entire nation of Israel. Why? Because in Joshua chapter chapter 1, God says, fear not, fear not. I'm with you again and again and again. And I love chapter 1, verse 9. Have not I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. Why? For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And that promise wasn't just for Joshua. God will be with us wherever we go. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will always be with you. So he is that promise, that, that reassurance that he will always be with us. And Jesus said... In Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, he said, Not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You're more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. 
So here's that promise, that reassurance that we're never alone, that He's always with us. Now, it's very important that we understand what these promises mean, that He's with us. They don't mean that if you follow God, then nothing bad will ever happen to you. If you are breathing, bad stuff is going to happen to you. If you're not breathing, really bad stuff is going to happen to you, okay? Now, the Apostle Paul said yes to God, and he went on the adventure of a lifetime. And he had a lot of bad things happen to him, if you look at Paul's life. God never promises that if you follow him, your life will be easy. You, you might suffer. You, you might hurt. The promise that gets made over and over and over is that he will always be with us. Then there's nothing that can separate us from God Nothing that happens to us can separate us from God. Nothing that happens to us can separate us from the love of God. The Apostle Paul, who had more bad things happen to him than I think anybody I've ever known, he said these words in Romans 8, 38. He said, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears of today nor worries worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so God is watching over us all the time. He will guide us. He will guard our lives. And then he will be eternally with us. And and here's what God is saying. He said, God has removed all eternal risk. Nothing can separate us from him. Nothing can separate us from his love. And because he's removed all eternal risk, then we can live lives that are more risky, that are more faith-filled in this world. God calls somebody. The person is scared. They feel inadequate. God gives a promise. He reassures them, I'll be with you. And then that leads us to the fourth component, which is the decision. The decision. We have to decide. What really matters is not whether you're uh, insecure or not, or you're, you feel inadequate or not. You probably will be. What matters or not is not whether you feel scared. You probably will be. I mean, if it's a big uh, call of God, what matters is our decision, whether we'll say yes or no. That's what matters. Friends, I want you to remember this. I want you to think about this. Only pe- people who say yes to the challenge, only people who say yes to the demand, only people who say yes to the risk and adventure of life, only people who say yes to God will ever feel fully alive. I believe that to be true. It was 11 years ago, I, I read a quote in, in a book by a friend of mine, by Rick Russo, and it was a quote at the beginning of a chapter, and this, this quote, this, this is a filter through that I have in my mind all the time, and it just has changed me. And the truth is, I've unpacked this before, it's changed our church as well. And this is the quote by Keith Johnstone, there are people who prefer to say yes, and there are people who prefer to say no. Those who say yes are rewarded by the adventures they have. And they, those who say no, are rewarded by the safety they attain. Now, the truth about us is that we need to learn to say no to all kinds of distractions. And it's, some people say they have a hard time saying no. I, I don't think that's really the case. I think they have a hard time saying yes. Because when you say yes to a high priority, then saying no to the lesser priorities, comes. it's really relatively easy. You say, no, it doesn't fit. That's not a priority for me. No, I can't do that. No. And so, but it's not about saying no to distractions. It's saying no to opportunities, to the call of God. And when, since God is calling you, when you say yes to the adventure, it's amazing. If you say no then you get the safety that you want. Somebody said, my greatest fear in life is that no one will remember me after I'm dead. You know who said that? I don't know, some dead guy said that. (laughs) I'm pretty sure he said no. (laughs) And he got the safety that he wanted. Friends, you do not want the song Born to be Mild played at your funeral. You do not want that song played at your funeral. Fifty people over age 95 were asked by a research organization, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? Top three answers, one of them was, I would risk more when they look back on their life. When people look back on their lives and if they have regret, more people look back on their lives and they have regret not of the things that they did, but they regret the things that they didn't do. And what matters when you get out of the seat 
is whether you'll say yes to God or not. What matters is whether you'll say yes or no. And Joshua, the one who was encouraged by God, be strong and courageous for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. At the end of his life, Joshua says these words to us. I mean, they're, they're words of wisdom. He said in Joshua 24, 15, he says, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. And he goes on to say, as for me and my house, I'll serve the Lord. And he's really saying, for me, for my house, we're just going to say yes, because that's faith. That's trusting. I'm not going to say no. I'm going to say yes, because I know God's plan for me far surpasses any plan that I could ever have for my life, and it might not appear to be comfortable, but I'm going to be faithful. So here's the thing. As we're kind of wrapping things up, will you say yes? To God, or will you say no to God? So let me ask you, what chair is God asking you to get out of today? Maybe you've already identified what the chair is. What's the chair that God is asking you to get out, out of in your life? What aspect of your life is He in? Come on, it's time to get out of that chair. Maybe it involves a relational risk, telling the truth to somebody. And the truth is you've been scared to tell them the truth. Maybe it's God calling you to a different vocational direction. Maybe you've been holding back because you've been afraid of making this transition. Maybe, maybe you've been holding on to your money right now because you'd like to buy a, well, a really expensive chair. I mean, I mean, you want to experience comfort at a whole new level, whatever that metaphor means. And he says, God is calling you to give some of your money away. And yet, you're kind of scared to let it go. Maybe God's asking you to explore some whole area where he's gifted you, to be able to serve other people, yet you've been holding back. For some of you, maybe you have an addiction that's quite destructive, and you're fearful that somebody's going to find out, and you're sensing maybe God's been calling you to go to get the help that you need. And so the, the question is, will you do that? Because whether somebody knows about it or not, my guess is it's affecting them. It always does. For some of you, maybe your marriage is kind of stagnant, and you need to have a courageous conversation with your wife, with your husband. For some of you, you're just at the very beginning of searching for God, and, and your call to get out of the chair is to move this from, well, the back burner to the front burner. I mean, it's been the back burner for a while. It's just kind of simmering there, but you're not making really any progress. But, but God's calling you to say, okay, come on now. Let's move this to the front burner. And your call is to say, okay, I'm going to read some books. I'm going to watch some videos. I'm going to talk to some people. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to learn if, if I really believe that this stuff is true or not. If it is and it has implications for my one and only life, then I'm going to, I'm going to decide. And where is God asking you to get out of the chair to say yes? And Friends, I want to tell you that it matters. It really does matter because this, the fifth and final component of this process, it's always this. It always leads to the changed life. We see this in the Bible again and again. Every story of a call from God ends up with the story of a changed life. In the Bible, every time somebody says yes to God, their life changes a little bit. Their life changes a lot. But there's always life change when someone says yes to God. I mean, there's this amazing story in the book of Acts, chapter 4. It's, I love the book of Acts because it's the story of the church, and the church literally they says it turned the world upside down, the, the kingdom of God, as it, as it came in power in the New Testament. And, and here we have in the early church, and this is after the crucifixion now. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. This is after Jesus ascends back to heaven. It's after the day of Pentecost and the church, 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost are baptized and the church is just exploding with power. And, and the very same authorities, the religious leaders that killed Jesus, that crucified him, or were responsible for that happening. They're now they're trying to shut this movement down. So they're trying to intimidate Peter and John, two of the, the apostles, the followers of, of Jesus. They're trying to intimidate. They, they arrest them. They, they beat them. They say, you don't say anything more about this Jesus. And I love 
this statement in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. It says, when they saw the courage, the courage, they had fear. Courage is just pushing through fear. That's all that is. Courage of Peter and John realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They had no status or position or impressive education of any kind. They're just ordinary guys. Press pause on that again. Elijah was a man just like us. They're all just ordinary guys with extraordinary faith that God used in incredible ways. They're just ordinary, ordinary men. And they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Isn't that great? That's about one of the greatest things you could ever say about another person. Wow, that person has been with Jesus. Jesus really rubbed off on, on them. Every time you say yes to God, friends, especially in a difficult situation, you, you change. You change a little every time you say yes to God. Your faith, it, it gets a little deeper. Your, your courage gets a little stronger. Your light shines a little brighter every time you say yes to God. Now, I want to be honest with you today. The opposite happens too. Every time you say no to God, when it's clear, when you know that He's calling you to do something, when you're prompted by Him, and yet you say no, every time that you say no to God, well, your heart, it gets a little colder. Your faith, it, it gets a little weaker. You get a little more addicted to the chair, and it gets a lot harder for you to get out of the chair in your spirit. Spirit just shrinks a little. It, it dies a little every time you say no to God. So will you say yes? Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, if you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find true life. And again, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, life in all of its fullness. That's the invitation to the adventurous life and this risky partnership with God. I want to wrap up today with a, one of my favorite all-time stories. I mean, I love stories. I, you know that. And this is a story. I haven't told this one in eight years. Um, but those of you that have been around community, you may have heard it a time or two. But it's, the, it's such a great story. It's a true story of an out-of-work truck driver by the name of Larry Walters who, lives in the heart, who lived in the heart of Los Angeles. And um, while he's unemployed, Larry Walters every day... He would sit in his backyard in a lawn chair just sipping lemonade and watch the planes, you know, because he lived near an airport. He would watch the planes take off and then land, take off and then land. He just watched that happen all day long. And so Larry decided that he himself wanted to experience the thrill of flight. And so he decided that with the proper equipment, he could turn his own lawn chair into a flying machine. And he became known as Lawn Chair Larry. He took 43 weather balloons. He filled them with helium. He made sure that before he did that, and before he, he attached those helium balloons, these weather balloons to his chair, he had his chair firmly anchored to the earth. And then he strapped on a parachute. And then he got into the chair and he had some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, some beer. Uh, he probably had a lot of beer before he did that. And then he got in and he had, and then he had a CB radio, and a BB gun. And his plan was, was to cut the rope and then just kind of hover maybe about 30 feet up in his backyard and then maybe out in his neighborhood and just kind of drift around for a little bit and then shoot, you know, one of the weather balloons and then just kind of slowly descend. I mean, that was the plan. I mean, what could possibly go wrong with that plan? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> this is just another one of those chapters of why women live longer than men, okay? <laughs> It is. I love this story. So, I couldn't, I'm not sure, you know, there's so many different parts. I was reading, you know, so many different accounts again, again yesterday on this. I'm not sure if somebody cut it or the line just broke or what happened, but the line when it came, I mean, when it, when it became unfastened, let's say he, he cut the rope, I mean, he was briskly launched to 16,000 feet in the air. I mean, it was incredible. It, it really was. And, and, and so uh, he's kind of freaking out, you know, as you would imagine, thinking he's going to go up 30 feet and he's 16,000 feet in the air. And so he's on the CB radio talking to his girlfriend and, and trying to alert people and, and uh, that, hey, you know, it was a big problem because when you're sitting in an aluminum chair 
three miles above the planet. That's not in the good category. And to add to that is he managed to launch himself into the approach quarter of LAX, one of the nation's busiest airports. And so as planes were ascending and descending toward LAX and the air traffic control, they see this strange splotch on their screens and they're trying to figure things out. And, and planes are uh, seeing him and two different planes identified and one, one pilot, a Pan Am pilot, radioed the tower and said, I don't know how to say this. But there's a guy in a lawn chair with a gun sitting in his lap up here. <laughs> now, that was before pilots were, you know, found to be drinking, before they'd get on planes. So they, 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 they believed him. And so anyway, now, how did Larry get down? Well, he was up there for about two hours. And so he starts to finally get the nerve, and he shoots out one weather balloon, then he shoots out another one, and shoots out another one, and then he, he drops the, the BB gun, but he, but he starts to descend, and he's up there for two hours, and, and so it becomes this big media event, and everybody's tracking him and going to him, and when he finally lands, he gets caught in some, some power lines, and he thought he was going to get fried by that, but he's like five feet above the ground, and so he slips out, and there's this impromptu press conference, and the, and the, the reporters, they ask him, they, they say, hey, were you scared? He goes, Yep. <laughs> Would you do it again? <laughs> no. And then they asked him the question, why did you do it? And he said, well, you just can't sit there. <laughs> Isn't that wild? You just can't sit there. You just can't sit there. You just, you just can't sit there. You can't, friends. God calls you to more. He calls you to way more. And so today, He is calling you to get out of the chair. Whatever that means, He's calling you to, sit to more. And you can say yes, or you can say no. But I'm imploring you to say yes. Jesus came to give you life in all of its fullness, and you can experience that. You can experience that when you say yes to God. So let's say yes. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, not every day do I thank you that life is uh, challenging, but on this day I do. Because, Father, you're much more interested in our character than you are our comfort. That you want to grow us, that you want to stretch us, that you want us to become more than we are right now. God, you created us with the capacity to fear, but you don't want our lives to be dominated by that. You want us to be people of faith. And without it, we, we can never even begin to please you. So, Father, I, I pray for everybody in this room right now, wherever they're at, whatever their chair is, that they would sense through your spirit that you were calling them to more, to get out of the chair. Father, I, I'm not asking you today through your spirit to just gently <laughs> to nudge us. Because maybe that's not enough. God, maybe through your spirit, you need to shake us and to call us to more. Father, I thank you for the great adventure that we can have in following Jesus. I thank you, Father, that he went to a cross to pay for the penalty of our sin so that our sins could be washed away, that he could rise to give us the hope of heaven one day and that we could follow him that he would never leave us, never forsake us. So, Father, I, I thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name and for his sake that we pray today. Amen.